to tell the story because I know tis true it satisfies my longings as nothing else can do I love to tell Turn with me, if you would, this evening to 2 Samuel chapter 22, and we'll look at verse 32 this evening, 2 Samuel twenty-two thirty-two. 32, for who is God save the Lord, and who is a rock save our God? The Hebrew uh, there is this, who is El, E-L, that's one of the names of God, in the scripture, who is El, save Jehovah, another one of God's names. God has many names in the scripture, each denoting a specific attribute of God, and three of them are in this one verse. That last word for God, who is a rock, save our God, that's a different word than the first trans translated word God there. El here means mighty, or the mighty one. Jehovah means the self-existing one, or the eternal God. The last word for God in the verse is Elohim, and it denotes power and authority also. But uh, the word Elohim, it's the word used for God in the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God, and that word Elohim is a plural noun. God is one God, but this refers to the three persons of his Godhead, his, the plurality of his Godhead in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Elohim. <clears throat> and listen, the powerful question that David is asking here is this. So we know that God and then the Lord, whenever you see Lord in all caps, capital L-O-R-D, that's Jehovah in the King James Bible. But that's another name for God. So he's saying, who is God save God? <laughs> that's the question he's asking. And it's, of course, a rhetorical question. He's saying that God is God. But he's saying it in the form of a question. The rhetorical question contained in this is simply this. If God is not God, then who is? And who is who is a God except God? Who is God if he's not? That's a good question. This is essentially the question that Job asked in Job 9.24. And I want you to turn with me and look at the language of Job 9 and verse 24. Listen to what he said here. Job 9.24, the earth is given into the hand of the wicked. Think about what he's saying and look around you in this world that we live in now, this generation that lives on this earth now. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. Job wasn't the, the first or the last person that's noticed this. This, run, this. this world is run by evil people. And then look what he said. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. That's talking about those who make the decisions in this world. It's not just judges as we use the word, you know, a Supreme Court justice or a, a circuit court judge or something like that. It's not just that. It's judges here is the people who make the decisions, who decide things in this world. Their faces are covered by somebody. They, they're blind. And look, if not, if he doesn't do that, it, whoever this he is, we're going to talk about, if not, then where is he and who is he? What a question Job asks here. And when, if ever, has Job's words here been more true than they are right now? The earth is given into the hands of the wicked. Look at the rulers of this world, not just our country. Look around the world. Think about it. We have a system of government here 
thank the Lord that limits the power of any one person. And it's the best. But, but, but think of the individuals who make up our government. How many of them would you say are corrupt, have sold out for money? Who, and how many of them actually care about the country and the people of this country? But mainly, look at the rest of the world. The, the dictators and, and tyrants of this world, the ones who make the decisions in this world. Why is it the way that it is? And look at the next phrase of Job's question. Somebody is covering the faces of the judges of the earth. Somebody's covering their faces. Now, again, it's not just judges sitting on a, on a bench, you know. This is the people who decide things, those in authority in this world. Their faces are covered. And let's not, let's not kid ourselves. Most, in most cases, the actual leaders of this world are just doing what, what they're, they're doing what they do because of money. It's the people that have the money or that are making the decisions, and they're just using these people to do it. So think about that. Whoever is calling the shots in any given situation or realm of this earth, they're blinded. Their faces are covered. We like to say justice is blind. You know, justice has no prejudices and, and, and is, is, um, is equal to all. But what Job is saying here is the truth is justice is not blind. The judges are blind. <laughs> There's a big difference. Big difference. They don't see what's real. They don't care. They only see what's in their mind and heart. They don't see the truth of what's around them. And what's, what's in the mind and heart of a sinner? Me, 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 me. Somebody is the cause of all that, Job said. Somebody's the one that's blinding them and making them blind to, to justice and judgment and truth. And Job is simply saying here that God is the one who is running the ones that are running things. That's it. That's a simple statement, isn't it? God runs the ones who run things. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. Hebrews 3, 4 uh, Paul wrote, therefore, every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Think about that. Somebody built everything. <laughs> I confess right up front that I'm taking that verse out of the context that it's in there in Hebrews 3. But think of the principle taught there and see it all in the word of God. This is true throughout the word. Every house, every nation, every household Every economy, every society, every government is built by some man or group of men. All of it is. But the one who built the ones that built it all is God. In other words, as, as Isaiah said in chapter 9, the government is on his shoulders. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one whose name is wonderful. The child who was born, but the son who was given. Whose name is wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father the Prince of Peace, he said the government is on his shoulder. What government? The government. The governing of governments is on his shoulders. He's the one that does all this. It's according to his purpose and his will. He worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. He doesn't consult men in it. He does as he pleases in the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of this earth, and none can stay his hand. Or say unto him, what doest thou? He that built all things, somebody built everything. And whoever that is, is God. David is saying, I know who it is. It's Jehovah. <laughs> That's who it is. It's Jehovah God. It's the God that we worship. Remember what Job asked at the end of that verse that we looked at there. If not, if God's not doing this, then where is God? And who is God? Wow, that, let's think about that. If God didn't purpose and cause and bring to pass all these things as they are in this world, then where in the world was God when they happened? Where was he? What was he doing? And who is the one who did this? Let's find out who God is. Or he might be asking it this way. Who is the pathetic God that didn't show up while all this was taking place? What God are you talking about? What God are you worshiping if he didn't do, if he didn't accomplish? Where was he and who is he? 
He didn't have much power, apparently. He must have been on vacation. That's what Elijah said about the false gods that, that, uh, of his day. He said, well, maybe they're sleeping or maybe they've gone on a vacation. They're not, they, they obviously can't hear you. <clears throat> now, sentimental religious people, mostly, cannot think that God would allow bad things to happen to good people. <laughs> well, you know, maybe your God wouldn't. But the first problem with that statement God wouldn't let bad things happen to good people. The first problem with that is there aren't any good people. And the second problem with that is this. The only time ever that something bad happened to someone who was good was at Calvary. That's the only time it ever happened. And we only say that it was bad in that it was evil. What we did was evil. There's no question about that. But God meant it for good. As Joseph said of his brother, he, he said to his brother, you did some evil to me, but God was doing good in that. He used the, your evil for good. That's what he does. That's the gospel. Our evil that was wrought at Calvary in murdering God's son, God meant it for good to save much people alive. As Joseph said, to save much people alive. And I'm one of them. Bless God. But bad things, you know, God doesn't do that. Well, let me ask you something. The only time that a bad thing happened to a good person was at Calvary. Who purposed that? Where was God when that happened? Who was in charge of that? Who brought that to pass? The Bible says it pleased the Lord to crush his son. That's what this book says. Many people would say, well, God, you know, that, that hurricane that came and killed thousands of people. God wouldn't do that. That was, that was Satan that did that. that. God wouldn't do that. Brother Job has a question for you. If God didn't do it, then who did? And where was he when they did it? Where was God Almighty when somebody killed thousands of people in his universe? That's a pretty good question, isn't it? Amos asks in Amos 3.6, Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? You know, this religious world scoffs at the idea that God would do something terrible like that. The Bible scoffs at the ones that scoff. Are you kidding me? You really think something happened in God's universe and he didn't do it? That word evil there, shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? That doesn't just mean sin, although that's included. It's not just saying, it's saying shall something bad happen somewhere and the Lord hasn't done it? If not, then who did it? And where was God when they did it? That's Job's question. How can we know that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose? You know how I know that? Because God makes it so. And you know how he does that? He rules all things and all people in, in every place, in all the places of his dominion. And that's everywhere. How, how could he do that if he's not controlling all things? I don't want to live in a world where, God, where the devil can do things without God and, and where even a germ, I don't even want, my pastor a long time ago used to say, if one germ is floating in the air that God's not in control of, we're all goners. One germ. I don't want to live in that world. I'm glad to live in the universe that God made and where he runs everything. If that germ comes to you, it's because he sent it. And he did it for your good if you're Christ's. Listen to where, where was God and who was God when this world was made? That's the, que that's the question that, that God answered now. Look at uh, in the book of Job with me. The book of Job, right before Psalms, chapter 38. I want to read you a passage of scripture. Where was God and what was he doing when this world was made? We like to say, as Paul the Apostle did, that Christ is all. That Christ is all and in all. If that's true, where was he when this world was made? Job 38, verse 1. Listen now, who do you think is speaking to Job here? The Lord who speaks audibly in the whirlwind. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to Job. 
Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Who is this that's talking about stuff and doesn't know what he's talking about? He doesn't have any knowledge of what he's saying. Gird up now your loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. God's not answerable to us, but we're answerable to him. When he says answer me, you better have something to say. Where were you, he said, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations of thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Where were you? When that happened, or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth, as if it had issued out of the womb, when I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hither too shalt thou come, but no further. And here shall thy proud waves be stayed. And throughout that whole chapter, chapter 38 of Job and the next one, chapter 39, God asked Job questions like these one after another. And do you know what Job's response was? It's in Job chapter 40, verse 3. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. I am contemptible and despicable. That's what he said. That's his response to God in his sovereign power. And listen, the one that, that, that was sovereign in the old creation is sovereign in the new creation. And he runs the world that he made. He's sovereign in providence. He's sovereign in salvation. He said, I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy. What are you going to say to that? I am contemptible and despicable, and I'm going to shut up now. That's what Job said. That was his response. I've heard people say, I've heard it more than once in my life, God, oh, God wouldn't send anybody to hell. Who is God save the Lord? If not, then where was he when somebody put them in hell? And who is God? Why do you think there is a hell? Where do you think hell came from? It was just something that was there when God, you know, just God just looked over there one day and there was a hell? The devil does that? Really? Is that what you what is that what your answer would be? You better lay your hand on your mouth before you say that. Who's going to cast the devil into hell then? If the devil's the one that casts people into hell, who's going to cast him into hell? Listen to Revelation 20 and verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Who do you think wrote that book? And who do you think those ones are whose names are written in that book? Those are the ones redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It's called the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb. The Lamb as it had been slain. His book, his book of life. And listen, if your name not in there, who do you think cast those ones into the lake of fire whose names were not in that book? What are we saying? Who is God except God? 
Who's t- who, who is it talking about? Listen, in Revelation 1.17, John describes the Lord Jesus Christ here, and he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Now, do you think there's an actual key to hell? You think so? There's like a physical key to hell that opens the door of hell. Or do you think Christ is saying, I'm the one who decides who lives or dies, and I'm the one who decides who goes to hell and who doesn't? You reckon that what he might have been saying? If there is an actual key, he's the one who holds it. And listen now, if the one who holds the keys of hell and of death says to you, you've got nothing to be afraid of, then you've got nothing to be afraid of. You know who he says that to? Those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now we're considering from Scripture this question that David asked rhetorically in his final song. Who is God but God? God says in Psalm 46, 10, be still. Just stand there and shut up and know that I am God. You say, well, you know, the title of this message this this evening is God is God. And you might say, well, everybody knows that. That's kind of obvious. God equals God. God is God. Very few people know that. Very few people. Most people think God is an old grandfather up there that's doing his best and trying, you know, to help everybody out and, and be, you know, uh, benign and, and congenial to everybody and be fair, you know, according to man's sense of fairness and all that. Very few people understand who God is and that he's God. God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The very definition of God is that he does as he pleases. But there's a little more to it than that. It's glorious just to think of the sovereign godhood of God. And and David's talking about that. He says the mighty, who is mighty except Jehovah? Who is all powerful? Who does what he wants to except him? Nobody else can say that. You can talk about man's free will all you want to. The free will of man is a stranger to this book. This book absolutely refutes the idea of man's will being free. First of all, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, your will is captive to Satan. Look it up. Read the Bible. Who is, who is mighty? Who can do what they want to except God? So that's what's being talked about here, and that's glorious, isn't it? But do you know what's even more wonderful than that? (laughs) How can anything be more wonderful than that? Well, listen, I just read to you, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. Somebody is going to acknowledge that he's the Lord and not us. I will be exalted in the earth. And that's glorious right there. But listen to the next verse. The Lord of hosts, that God who is God, is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. (laughs) Think about that for a second. And that's what the psalmist wrote, Selah, after that. That means stop and think about that for a second. The one who is on the throne of the universe and does as he pleases, and holds the keys of hell and of death in his hand, is my refuge. He's with me, and that doesn't mean physically. If God is with you, he's with you because he's for you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? Oh, now that's, now you're talking wonderful. Now, when you just simply think about God being God, doing as he pleases, as David said in Psalm 115, 3 is where he said it, but our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. And that's glorious just to think about that, his power and authority and omnipresent omniscience and omnipotence. That means he's everywhere, all-knowing and all-powerful. But David didn't start that psalm that way. Listen to the, to the passage, Psalm 115, 1 through 3. Not unto us, O Lord, 
Not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. And there it is again, all caps, Lord, Jehovah. Not unto us, O Jehovah. Not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. What for, David? For your mercy. <laughs> because you have mercy on sinners like me. And for your truth's sake, let's give glory to God for his gospel's sake. Thank God there's good news for sinners like me. And you know what it is? You know what the good news is? Those angels sang glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And you know when they sang that? They were talking about a, a person when they sang that. The, the, the Lord Jesus Christ was born that day into this world. And you know what his name was? God with us. God with us. Listen to it. For your mercy and for your truth's sake, wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? But our God's in the heavens. The one who is merciful and whose truth is all glorious is in the heavens, and he does whatever he wants to. The one who has mercy has mercy on who he wants to have mercy on. That's what David's saying. That's what God said. I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and whom I will I'll harden. Oh, glory to his name. God has always done what he pleased, and none can stay his hand or question him. And what is it that God has been pleased to do? It pleased the Lord to crush his son. It pleased the Lord to have mercy on sinners. And the only way mercy can be had for sinners is by the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody said this, and I heartily agree because it's from the word of God. Listen, though, the way this is, this is said, I, I like the, the greatest glory of God that God has ever seen fit to reveal to sinners is his glory in saving sinners by the sacrifice of his only begotten, well-beloved son. I believe that. I believe that that is according to scripture. Listen to what what, I believe that's what Paul wrote in Romans 9, 21. He said this, Hath not the potter power over the clay? That's just kind of obvious, isn't it? Guess who the potter is and guess who the clay is. Hath not the potter power over the clay, authority and power, ability, of the same lump, all human, there's no difference, to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory? And then Paul said this even us, <laughs> even wretched, vile, worms like us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now listen to me. You can see something of the glory of God in a beautiful sunrise. You might look at the sun coming up in the morning and say, oh, how glorious God is. You know, the scripture says in Psalm 19, when the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. But if you're going to see the riches of God's glory, you won't see that in the sky. To see the riches of God's glory, as declared there in Romans 9.21, you're going to have to hear the gospel and believe on the Son of God. You're going to have to know something about this. Listen to the language of Hebrews 1.1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. We talked about that. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, 
when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now you think about this. The one who is the brightness of the glory of God and who is the very image, the very exact image of the person of the Father would not sit down until he had redeemed me with his precious blood. That's the riches of the glory of God. Here's the brightness of God's glory. Here's the riches now. Isaiah 53, 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised or crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. When he gave himself, when he made his own soul an offering for sin, he redeemed somebody. And the brightness of his glory now is not just that he bore our iniquities, but that he actually put them away. And all for whom he died are justified before God. We're going to read some more in Isaiah 53 in a minute, and that's exactly what we're going to read. Those for whom he died are justified by his precious blood. Most of those who call themselves Christians in this world, the reason we stress this is because most of the people who call themselves Christians in this world believe in a Jesus that died as a best effort to save as many as would make effectual what he could not. In other words, he didn't actually save anybody. He just made salvation available to anybody who had the good sense to save themselves. That's what passes for a gospel in this religious world. But if you're a real sinner, here's your Savior. It pleased the Lord to crush him. This is verse 10 of Isaiah 53. He, his father, hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. The Lord Jesus Christ crucified is not an offer that God makes to sinners. He, he was an offering. He is an offering made unto God for sinners. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, those who are produced as a result of that, who are born again as a result of that. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That just simply means that whatever God purposed to accomplish by the death of his son, he accomplished it. The good pleasure of the Lord in crushing his son was accomplished. It prospered in the hand of his son. He laid help upon one who is mighty. And he accomplished salvation and then he said it's finished. He shall see of the travail of his soul, the soul that he made an offering for my sin, and shall be satisfied. He's not going to be disappointed because somebody didn't believe on him. He died to save his elect and he saved his elect. You got a problem with that? Come to him. Come to, he said, I won't cast you out, whoever comes to me. But he also said this, all that the Father giveth me are coming to me. Don't miss that part. This is who we're dealing with now. Who is God except God? He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant. God never had but one righteous servant. You say, well, I'm the servant of God. Well, in a sense, we are. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. But we're not righteous, not in ourselves. He's talking about our Savior there. And he said, my righteous servant shall justify many. Not everybody, but everybody he represented when he prayed his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, he said, I don't pray for this world, but I pray for those you gave me. 
That's who he represented. Are you one of those? I don't know. Come to him and find out. Come to Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And how's he going, how's he going to justify? For he shall bear their iniquities. Our substitute, the Lord Jesus Christ, bore our iniquities in our place and the wrath of God for our iniquities in our place. And we are free. When the Son makes you free, you're free indeed. And that's how he does it. When by God-given faith, a sinner looks to Calvary and sees salvation finished, accomplished for him by God's Son, sees the riches of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, then surely the declaration of that sinner's heart is this, who is God save the Lord? Who is God save the Lord? And from God's own holy word, we have the only answer to that question from Jehovah himself. Isaiah 45, 21, there is no God else beside me a just God and a Savior. Think about that for a minute before we close. How can God be a just God and save a sinner? If God is perfectly holy and strictly just, then sinners have got to go to hell. How can he be a just God and a Savior? Romans 3.24. Let me read it to you. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's by Christ and him crucified. That we're justified freely without a cause in us. The cause of our justification is in Christ. Not a, We're justified freely by his grace, by the grace of God, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation, a mercy seat, a sin offering through faith in his blood. Do you believe in his blood? Do you believe that the blood of Christ is sufficient to wash all of your sin away? And that when he shed that precious blood, he saved everybody he shed it in order to save? Do you believe in his blood? To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in that he might be a just God and a savior of him which believeth in Jesus. <laughs> May God, by his sovereign grace, Almighty grace. He sits upon the throne of grace tonight. And may he from that throne grant us a sight of our Lord Jesus Christ, the all-sufficient, mighty captain of our salvation. And may we say from our heart, who in the world is a God except God, a just God, and yet he saved me by the precious blood of his son. Amen.